No respect of persons with God. The religion of Christ uplifts the receiver to a higher plane of thought and action, while at the same time it presents the whole human race as alike the objects of the love of God being purchased by the sacrifice of a son. At the feet of Jesus, the rich and the poor, the learned and the ignorant meet together with no thought of caste or worldly preeminence. All earthly distinctions are forgotten as we look upon him whom our sins have pierced. The self-denial, the condescension, the infinite compassion of him who was highly exalted in heaven puts to shame human pride, self-esteem, and social caste. Pure, undefiled religion manifests its heaven-born principles in bringing into oneness all who are sanctified through the truth. All meet as blood-bought souls, alike independent upon him who has redeemed them to God. Subheading, Talents. The Lord has lent men talents to improve. Those whom he has entrusted with money are to bring that talent of means to the master. Men and women of influence are to use which God has given them. The ones whom he has endowed with wisdom are to bring to the cross of Christ this gift to be used to his glory. And the poor have their talent, which perhaps may be larger than any other mentioned. It may be simplicity of character, humility, tried virtue, confidence in God. Through patient toil, through their anti-dependence upon God, they are pointing those with whom they associate to Jesus, their Redeemer. They have a heart full of sympathy for the poor, a home for the needy and oppressed, and their testimony is clear and decided as to what Jesus is to them. They seek for glory, honor, and immortality, and their reward will be eternal life. Subheading, Human Brotherhood. In the human brotherhood, it takes all kinds of talents to make a perfect whole, and the Church of Christ is composed of men and women of varied talents and of all ranks and all classes. God never designed that the pride of men should dissolve that which his own wisdom had ordained, the combination of all classes of minds, of all the varied talents to make a complete whole. There should be no depreciation of any part of God's great work, whether the agencies are high or lowly. All have their part to act in diffusing light in different degrees. There should be no monopolizing of what belongs, in a measure, to all, high and low, rich and poor, learned and unlearned. Not a ray of light must be undervalued, not a ray shut out, not a gleam unrecognized or even acknowledged reluctantly. Let all act their part for truth and righteousness. The interests of the different classes of society are indissolubly united. We are all woven together in the great web of humanity, and we cannot, without loss, withdraw sympathies from one another. It is impossible for a healthy influence to be maintained in the church when the common interest and sympathy does not exist. Subheading, Exclusiveness. There is no caste with God. He ignores everything of the kind. All souls are of value with him. Laboring for the salvation of the soul is employment worthy of the highest honor. It matters not what may be the form of our labor, or among what class, whether high or low. In God's sight, these distinctions will not affect its true worth. The sincere, earnest, contrite soul, however ignorant, is precious in the sight of the Lord. He places his own signet upon men, judging not by their rank, not by their wealth, not by their intellectual greatness, but by their oneness with Christ. The unlearned, the outcast, the slave, if he has made the most of his opportunities and privileges, if he has cherished the light given him of God, has done all that is required. The world may call him ignorant, but God calls him wise and good, and thus his name stands registered in the books of heaven. God will fit him up to do him honor, not only in heaven, but on the earth. The divine rebuke is upon him who refuses the companionship of those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, simply because they are not rich, learned or honored in this world. Christ, the Lord of glory, is satisfied with those who are meek and lowly in heart, however humble may be their calling, whatever their rank or degree of intelligence. 
Subheading, Training for Service. How many useful and honored workers in God's cause have received their training amid the humble duties of the most lowly positions in life? Moses was the prospective ruler of Egypt, but God could not take him from the king's court to do the work appointed him. Only when he had been for forty years a faithful shepherd was he sent to be the deliverer of his people. Gideon was taken from the threshing floor to be the instrument in the hands of God for delivering the armies of Israel. Elisha was called to leave the plow and do the bidding of God. Amos was a husbandman, a tiller of the soil, when God gave him a message to proclaim. All who become co-workers with Christ will have a great deal of hard, uncongenial labor to perform, and their lessons of instruction should be wisely chosen and adapted to their peculiarities of character and the work which they are to pursue. Subheading, Care and Training the Youth. The Lord has presented to me in many ways and at various times how carefully we should deal with the young that it requires the finest discrimination to deal with minds. Everyone who has to do with the education and training of youth needs to live very close to the great teacher to catch his spirit and manner of work. Lessons are to be given which will affect their character and life work. They should be taught that the gospel of Christ tolerates no spirit of caste, that it gives no place to unkind judgment of others, which tends directly to self-exaltation. The religion of Jesus never degrades the receiver, nor makes him coarse and rough, nor does it make him unkind in thought and feeling toward those for whom Christ died. There is danger of attaching too much importance to the matter of etiquette and diverting much time to education upon the subject of manner and form that can never be of great use to many youth. Some are in danger of making the externals all important, of overestimating the value of mere conventionalities. The results will not warrant the expenditure of the time and thought given to these matters. Some are trained to give much attention to these things, manifest little true respect or sympathy for anything, however excellent, that fails to meet their standard of conventionality. Anything that would encourage ungenerous criticism a disposition to notice and expose every defective error is wrong. It fosters distrust and suspicion, which are contrary to the character of Christ and detrimental to the mind thus exercised. Those who are engaged in this work gradually depart from the true spirit of Christianity. The most essential, enduring education is that which will develop the nobler qualities which will encourage a spirit of universal kindliness leading the youth to think no evil of anyone, lest they misjudge motives and misinterpret words and actions. The time devoted to this kind of instruction will yield fruit to everlasting life. Subheading, Christ's Example, A Rebuke to Exclusiveness. In every age since Christ was among men, there have been some who chose to seclude themselves from others, manifesting a pharisaical desire for preeminence. Shutting themselves away from the world, they have not lived to bless their fellow men. There is no example in the life of Christ for the self-righteous bigotry. His character was genial and beneficent. There is not a monastic order upon earth from which he would not have been excluded for overstepping the prescribed rules. In every religious denomination and in almost every church are to be found erratics who would have blamed him for his liberal mercies. They would have found fault with him because he ate with publicans and sinners. They would have accused him of worldly conformity in attending a wedding feast, and would have censured him unmercifully for permitting his friends to make supper in honor of him and his disciples. But on these very occasions, by his teachings as well as by his generous conduct, he was enshrining himself in the hearts of those whom he honored with his presence. He was giving them an opportunity to become acquainted with him and to see the marked contrast between his life and teachings and those of the Pharisees. Those with whom God has entrusted his truth must possess the same beneficent spirit that Christ manifested. They must adopt the same broad plans of action. They should have a kind, generous spirit toward the poor, and in a special sense feel that they are God's stewards. They must hold all that they have, property, mental powers, spiritual strength, as not their own, but only lent them to advance the cause of Christ in the earth. Like Christ, they should not shun the society of their fellow men, 
but should seek it with the purpose of bestowing upon others the heavenly benefits they have received from God. Do not be exclusive. Do not seek out a few with whom you delight to associate and leave others to take care of themselves. Suppose you do see some weakness in one and folly in another. Do not stand aloof from them and associate with those only who you think are about perfect. The very souls you despise need your love and sympathy. Do not leave a weak soul to struggle alone, to wrestle with the passions of his own heart without your help and prayers, but consider yourself lest you also be tempted. If you do this, God will not leave you to your own weakness. You may have sins greater in his sight than the sins of those you condemn. Do not stand off and say, I am holier than thou. Christ has thrown his divine arm around the human race. He has brought his divine power to man that he might encourage the poor, sin-sick, discouraged soul to reach up for a higher life. Oh, we need more of Christ's spirit and much less of self. We need the converting power of God upon our hearts daily. We need the mellowing spirit of Christ to subdue and soften our souls. The only way for those to do who feel that they are whole is to fall upon the rock and be broken. Christ can change you into his likeness if you will submit yourself to him. If we follow in Christ's footsteps, we must come close to those who need our ministry. We must open the Bible to the understanding, present the claims of God's law, read the promises to the hesitating, arouse the careless, strengthen the weak. 